welcome to the Hillsdale College Online Courses Podcast. I'm Kyle. And I'm Juan. And I'm excited. We actually have a, a newcomer, an exciting newcomer to the show today, Jeremiah Regan. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah, uh, happy to join the team. I have did my undergraduate at Hillsdale and my graduate studies, and pleased to say that Kyle and I have been friends going on 20 years now. And we're really excited to introduce him because he's the new executive director of online learning. He's jumping into this role. I'm taking a new spot. I'll, I'll remain at the college, but I'm taking a, a new spot at the college. And that means that I won't be able to be a part of these fun conversations about these online courses, but I will be tuning into the podcast and watching our videos and continuing to be a student of online courses. Very excited to see what you guys have in store for the future here, Jeremiah and Juan. And today we're going into the final lecture of the Exodus story, lecture eight, titled Moses and the Glory of God. Now, it's interesting that last lecture, on lecture seven, we were on Exodus chapter 20. And if you remember, Exodus has 40 chapters. So this lecture is going to cover 20 chapters of Exodus. (laughs) Well, there's a reason for that. There's a lot of descriptions of things that God tells the Israelites to do and commands them. And so the narrative gets a little short. What Dr. Jackson is doing in this lecture is mostly covering the that narrative. But I think one of the, at least for me, one of the most beautiful parts is towards the end of the lecture, Dr. Jackson sort of summarizes the the narrative and what's been going on and what do you learn from the book of Exodus. And it's the balance of between justice and mercy and, and understanding those two sides of, of God. And I, I thought that was beautiful. It's very striking that, God is enraged at the Israelites making a golden idol right after he had instructed them not to. And it's Moses who calms him down, demonstrating mercy. But when Moses goes down to the Israelites and sees what they're doing, he too is enraged. And God has to bring him back and teach him mercy the way Moses had just demonstrated mercy to God. It's a really interesting contrast and in, in shift in events. No question. It's, it's very dramatic. This lecture strikes at one of the the great themes, I think, of our courses, right? Which is understanding both the nature of God and the nature of man. And I think Dr. Jackson does a great job of that. You'll learn a ton from this lecture. I hope that you'll continue to go to hillsdale.edu slash course to learn about that theme and to dig into the full liberal arts education that we're trying to produce through Hillsdale College Online Courses. So you can sign up for our courses anytime at hillsdale.edu slash course. And without further ado, it's my honor to kick it over to Dr. Jackson for Lecture 8, the final lecture of the Exodus story. Thank you. In our last lecture, we took a look at the the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. And we wanted to look at the relationship between God and man. And and God sets out certain, certain rules for the Israelites. And he warns them specifically at the end of chapter 20. He warns them specifically, do not make yourself gods of gold and do not make yourself gods of silver. And in chapter 24 in Exodus, Moses goes up and he's up there for 40 days and 40 nights. And so now as we move into chapter 32, we're going to look at chapter 32 to 34. And we're going to see Moses coming down off the mountain after this disaster of the golden calf. Chapter 32, verse 1. And the people saw that Moses lagged in coming down from the mountain. And the people assembled against Aaron and said to him, Rise up, make us gods that will go before us. For this man, Moses, who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has happened to him. And Aaron said to them, Take off the golden rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. And all the people took off the golden rings that were on their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he took them from their hand, and he fashioned it in a mold and made it into a molten calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. And Aaron saw and built an altar before it. And Aaron called out and said, Tomorrow is a festival to the Lord. And they rose early on the next day, and they offered up burnt offerings and brought forward communion sacrifices. And the people came back from eating and drinking, and they rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Quick, go down, for your people that you brought up from Egypt have acted ruinously. I just want to stop there. We'll pick up on that again. First thing we want to do is to pay attention to a few things here. Notice that the people assembled against Aaron. They're going to put pressure on Aaron here. 
Alter's translation, he says, rise up, make us gods. Many of you, your translations may have, make us a god. The word there is Elohim, which is technically in the plural. It means gods, but it's used throughout scripture, obviously, for one of the names of God in the singular. Alter's gone with the plural here. Um, uh, other, uh, other translations will put it in the singular, and I think there is a slight difference between the two. If we say, and I'm not making an argument one way or the other, I just want to show you the difference of this. If we go with altar and it says, make us gods, this means that in some way, shape, or form, they've reverted to some sort of polytheism. Get us those gods that perhaps were there in Egypt, all those gods that we knew before when we had the one God. Get that for us. Make us those gods. All right, in the plural, so polytheism. If it's rise up and make us a god, then it's not necessarily polytheism, but it's an act of idolatry. Make us, make us a statue of our God, the way in which all of these other religions, polytheistic religions, make idols of their God, except here it would just simply be uh, in the singular. Now, as I continue, I'm going to keep reading it in the plural, but I just want to show you the slight difference between those two. And of course, Aaron gives way and he's going to acquiesce and give the Israelites what it is that they ask for. A curious line here from Aaron. He says, tomorrow is a festival to the Lord. I like to give a charitable reading of this for Aaron. He knows what he's doing is a disaster. He has to know, right? He's been Moses' prophet. If, if Moses is a god to Aaron, Aaron is his prophet. And now what's he doing? He's making an idol. He's making a statue for the Israelites. Give me these things. So when he says, tomorrow is a festival to the Lord, I have to imagine Aaron's trying to put this off as long as humanly possible, probably praying to God, oh man, please send Moses back down here. Let us be done with this. I don't want to have to do this thing. And now God says to Moses, quick, go down. And now I want us to have some fun with this language here. Go down for your people <laughs> that you brought from Egypt has acted ruinously. Notice what God's doing. He's saying to Moses, these are your people, which by the way is true. But then he says, you brought up from Egypt, which is true. It's true. But notice that's the first, that's the line from the first commandment as well that they have forgotten that it's their, the Lord, their God, who brought them up out from Egypt. So, so God's pus, putting this on, he's putting this on Moses. Look at your people. They have made themselves a molten calf and bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Notice the repetition, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. That's the first commandment. So there's a real irony here. Here's this golden calf who brought you up from the land of Egypt, and this is the idol. Again, whether we take it, these are your gods, or this is your God, whether it's polytheism or if it's idolatry, makes no difference because it's still using that first line of the first commandment. And the Lord said to Moses, I see this people, and look, it is a stiff-necked people. And now leave me be that my wrath may flare against them and I will put an end to them and I will make you a great nation. Notice the language here. Look at this people. Notice God's creating that distance, right? He just said to Moses, look at your people whom you brought out of Egypt. It's as if God is saying, they're all yours now, Moses, or even worse, I'm just going to wipe them out. Let's just go with you. Let's just get rid of them. Look at what Moses does. And Moses implored the presence of the Lord, his God. He implores God. Moses is a beautiful prophet. On behalf of God, you go to the people, knowing the risks that it takes. Remember, Moses tells God earlier, they're going to stone me. And God goes, well, go on then. Go, go see what happens, right? So on behalf of God, you go to the people. And that's always tough because rarely does a prophet have anything good to say to the people. Uh, rarely do you see a prophet who goes to the people and goes, hey, you're doing a magnificent job with the widows and orphans. Love what you're doing there. Your obedience is amazing. It's incredible. Good job. God. Never is a prophet doing this. A prophet, his first job is to call people back to God, which means to call them to repentance. Notice, and now the, the other difficult thing is, now what does the prophet do? On behalf of God, you go to the people. <sighs> this is what's tough. 
but on behalf of the people, and here it says the stiff-necked people, on behalf of the people, you have to go to God. This is what Moses is doing now. Why, O Lord, should your wrath flare against your people that you brought out of the land of Egypt? Notice God tells Moses, your people you brought out. How does Moses respond? Why should your wrath flare against your people whom you brought out of Egypt? Which is in then reiterating that first commandment. They're just playing off of one another here. Each one saying to the other one, you have a responsibility to this people. God to Moses, you have a responsibility to this uh, people. Moses to God, no, you have a responsibility to this people whom you brought out of, the, out of Egypt. There's your first commandment. Whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a strong hand. Why should the Egyptians say, for evil he brought them out to kill them in the mountains, to put an end to them on the face of the earth? Turn back from your flaring wrath and relent from the evil against your people. What a stunning moment. Turn back. That's the language of repentance. Stop and turn back, God, from this thing. Why should they die here when you did everything great for them, getting them out of Egypt? Turn back from this and relent against the evil, against your people. It's incredible. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself and spoke to them. He's reminding God of all of those things God said in those early chapters, chapters 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. I'm the Lord, your God of the fathers of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses is trying to remind him of all this. And by the way, if you ask me, oh, so is Moses really convincing God here? Is Moses really getting God to change his mind? No, he's not. In fact, I would flip it. In all things, I think God is here testing Moses. He's expressing legitimate wrath via justice in front of Moses. But I think it's also a test for Moses to see how are you going to respond to this God? on behalf of the people. Moses, will you do your job? And it turns out Moses is in fact doing his job. And he says, when you yourself spoke to them, I will multiply your seed like the stars of the heaven and all this land. I said, I will give to your seed and they will hold it in a state forever. And the Lord relented from the evil that he had spoken to do to his people. It's this beautiful moment. You get to see the desired justice, and then what? But in order to do justice, in order, in order to make things right, to an ordered world where these are his people, what must God possess? Mercy. And what Moses is doing is reminding him of all of the promises that he's made. So while we get the sense in the, the iteration of justice, let my wrath flare against them, at the same time, it's, but you have a responsibility to them. And that may take time. To do justice may take time. In order to do that, we must also then uh, be merciful there. And of course, we know next we have Moses coming back. And Moses' fl wrath flared, verse 19, he flung the tablets from his hand smashed them at the bottom of the mountain and he took the calf that they had made and burned it in fire and ground it fine and scattered it in the water and made the Israelites drink it. And so Moses was just begging on behalf of the Israelites for God to relent from his evil on behalf of the Israelites. Now you get to see the beautiful parallelism here. On behalf of God, what happens? His wrath flares. Well, what did God want? God wanted his wrath to flare. So on behalf of God, he goes to the people with this sense of justice. And Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you should have brought upon it great offense? And Aaron said, let not my Lord's wrath flare. You yourself know that this people is in an evil way. And they said to me, make us gods that will go before us. For this man, Moses, who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has happened to him. And I said to them, whoever has gold, take it off. And they gave it to me. And I flung it into the fire and out came this calf. I just love that line. I, I don't know how it happened. Out came this calf. I, you know, I, I didn't actually make the mold or anything like this. It's just quite a, a miracle here. And Moses saw that the people that it was let loose for Aaron had let them loose as a shameful thing to their adversaries. And this is whenever we see this violence that comes here. When Moses calls out, whoever is on 
on God's side, let them come to me. Whoever's not. And on that day, 3,000 men go down. This is a disaster. There is that sense of justice here. So when we talk about a merciful God, we still also see things have to be set right. And it happened on the next day that Moses said to the people, you have committed a great offense, and now I shall go up to the Lord. Perhaps I may atone for your offense. And Moses went back to the Lord and said, I beg you, this people has committed a great offense. They have made themselves gods of gold. And now, if you would bear their offense, and if not, wipe me out, pray from your book what you have written. Look at that line. What a beautiful moment. Going back to God, saying even to himself, save this people. I offer myself up on their behalf. If you remember in, in the David story, he does the same thing on behalf of his people. There's something here with those who are close to God who intercede on behalf of others that they're willing to say, this is my fault. And even here, Moses isn't just saying it's my fault. May I not be remembered so that you can remember them. And the Lord said to Moses, he was offended against me. I shall wipe him out from my book. If we could, I would like to skip ahead here because what we've been to to chapter uh, 33, because we've been looking at God and Moses going back and forth. Whose people are the your people? No, they're your people. This people, your people, my people. Now we're going to see God and Moses drawing even closer. And I think it's really important that they're drawing closer after we've seen Moses intercede on behalf of the people to God and on behalf of God to the people. I think Moses is finally ready to be this prophet of God and to have an even closer relationship with Hashem. And Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, yet you've not made known to me whom you will send with me. And you you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my eyes. And now, if, pray, I found favor in your eyes, let me know, pray, your ways, that I may know you, so that I may find favor in your eyes. And see, for this nation is your people. And he said, My presence shall go, and I will grant you rest. And Moses said to him, if your present does not go, do not take up from here. And how then will it be known that I found favor in your eyes, I and your people? Will it not be by your going with us that I and your people may be distinguished from every people that is on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, this thing too, which you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my eyes, and I have known you by name. And Moses said, show me, pray your glory. And he said, I shall make all my goodness pass in front of you. I shall invoke the name of the Lord before you. I shall grant grace to whom I grant grace and have compassion for whom I have compassion. And God said, you shall not be able to see my face for no human can see me and live. And the Lord said, look, there is a place with me and I shall put you in the cleft of the crag and shield you with my palm until I have passed over. And I shall take away my palm and you shall see my back but my face will not be seen. Hey there. Today, I want to tell you about the Hillsdale K-12 Classical Education Podcast. This unique show explains how children benefit from an American classical education. Whether you're a teacher, student, or parent, you'll find something of value on the show. You'll hear from teachers and administrators from schools around the country, as well as Hillsdale professors and friends who are leading the effort to revive the American tradition of K-12 education. When you listen, you'll learn all about classical education, what it is, how to teach it, and why it matters today. And there are dozens of back episodes on specific topics, like teaching Singapore math, reading great books, and even understanding how athletics is critical to a child's development. Listen every Monday on podcast.hillsdale.edu. That's podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you find your audio. And as we skip here to chapter 34 to watch the end of the scene, and I want to go back and comment on this, but here it is, chapter 34, verse 4, when Moses carves out two stone tablets like the first, and Moses rose early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had charged him. And he took in his hand the two stone tablets. And the Lord came down in a cloud and stationed himself there. 
And God invoked the name of the Lord. He invoked the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and called out, The Lord, the Lord, that is Hashem, Hashem, which is mercy, a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in kindness and good faith, keeping kindness for the thousandth generation, bearing crime, trespass, and offense. And I'm going to stop the verse there. Why? Because Exodus 34, 6 is going to be one of the most predominant names of God you're going to see throughout Scripture. You'll find it in the book of Jonah. You find it in the prophets. It's a reminder that this is, in fact, God's name. Merciful, kind, slow to judgment, which is a perfect moment as, as Moses is bringing down the recarved tablets for the people. It's, you messed up, and here we go again. And here's the reminder of what my name is. And I want to just speak just very briefly about Moses being stuck in the crag and not being able to see God's face, for no one can see God's face and live. That means God in his totality. It's to be able to understand and see everything about God. But make no mistake, Moses does see God. He does encounter God. He encounters him closely, intimately. He sees his backside, and though the backside is not the face of God, the God in his total and complete glory, it is still the glory of God, the kavod of God. It's how God comes to Moses, and it is still God, just not God in his totality. And this becomes important. Why? Because then we get to start to see in chapter 34, verse 30, as Moses comes to the people, and Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, and look, the skin of his face glowed, and they were afraid to come near him. And Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the chiefs in the community came back to him, and Moses spoke to them. And afterward, all the Israelites drew near, and he charged them with what the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And Moses finished speaking with them, and he put a veil on his face. And when Moses came before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And he would come out to speak to the Israelites that which had been charged. And the Israelites would see Moses' face, that the skin of Moses' face glowed. And Moses would put the veil back on his face until he came to speak with him. All right. This is one of those things where uh, uh, lots of readers are going, what in the heck is going on here with Moses' face glowing like this? It has everything to do with Moses being in the presence of God and actually seeing his backside. What does that mean? That means Moses is interacting with the kavod of God, the glory of God, which is God himself. Not in his fullness, not in his face, but with God himself. So what is the glowing that you see on Moses' face? It is, I'll just call it, I don't know what you would technically call it, is, it is the residual glory of God that still sticks to Moses as he speaks to God as one would speak to his fellow man. It's that intimacy there with God where Moses is glowing with the glory of God, so much so that when the people come to him, they put a veil over his face because the glory is too much. That residual glory is still too much even for the Israelites to handle, to look at, to see. The residual glory on Moses' face. So if Moses can see the backside of God and the people can't even see the residual glory on Moses' face, that gives you a sense of how close Moses is to God, how holy Moses is. And one final thing here with that glowing face and the veil. I hope you guys can all see the temple imagery that's already there. The glory of God that, that, that's there in, in Moses' face, which is veiled when he's in front of the people, unveiled when he's there with God, because the glory can interact with the glory. The glory can handle the glory. The veil, it's a temple imagery. What's covered by the veil in the temple? The holy of holies. That is the place of God. So what you see here in Moses' face, this kind of pre-temple imagery, is in fact the Holy of Holies. This is the Holy of Holies. This is where the divine presence is there in Moses' face. Again, in this pre-temple, proto-temple imagery of the glory of God being covered by the veil. And so then it makes sense from chapters 35 to 40 that we, we have a lot of details about the, uh, the tent of meeting and I'm not going to go into all of, all of the rubrics of how to build the tent and everything that will go into it. Rather, I just want to take us to the end of Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. 
And the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord, the glory, the kavod of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses could not come into the tent of meeting for the cloud abode upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Notice, don't mistake Moses' glory with the glory of the Lord. Even Moses knows this. And when the cloud went up from over the tabernacle, the Israelites would journey onward in all their journeyings. And if the cloud did not go up, they would not journey onward until the day it went up. For the Lord's cloud was over the tabernacle by day and fire by night was set in it before all the eyes of the house of Israel in all of their journeyings. And I love that last line, before the eyes of the house of Israel. <laughs> we began Exodus so long ago with the Israelites being called the Hebrews from the outside. And now this final line, we get to say, in the house of Israel, they're following God in the cloud in the house of Israel, in all their journeyings. And although the next book in the Pentateuch is Leviticus, this sets us up actually for numbers and all of their wilderness wanderings. It's been a joy to teach you this class, to work through the book of Exodus once again. I don't know how many times I've read it in my life, but it's been plenty. And my goodness, I'm astounded every time I go through it by the beauty of its poetry, by the beauty of its imagery, by the way in which it sets up its narrative. But I think the thing that strikes me the most is it is the one text that gives us these many faces of God. We get the Elohim, the God of justice, and Hashem, the God of mercy, and we start to understand the balance that is between those two. We understand the significance of obedience, and when we disobey, to repent, to turn back to God. And then ultimately, what do we know? In order to do those things, in order to even think about a repentance, we have to believe in both a God of justice, Elohim, and a God of mercy, Hashem, because we know what we ought to do. But in order to do what we ought to do, we have to rely on God's mercy, His long-suffering, and His compassion. It's been a joy. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Hillsdale Online Courses Podcast. If you want to continue learning about the Book of Exodus or other topics, please visit hillsdale.edu slash course. There you will find over 40 free online courses, including Ancient Christianity, the Genesis Story, Classic Children's Literature, and many more. The courses include additional readings, study guides, fully produced videos, and you can chat with your fellow students on a dedicated forum. Upon completing a course, you will also get a certificate. All our courses are free because we believe that a virtuous citizen is the best defense for liberty. So pursue the education necessary for freedom and happiness at hillsdale.edu slash course today. That's hillsdale.edu slash course. Thanks for listening. <laughs>